see what we bend over with. Uh, at least dive uh, or put our toe in the water anyway with regards to the third person of the Trinity. How many of you are totally unfamiliar with that expression, the Trinity? Heard of the Trinity? Yeah, no Trinity? Yeah, okay, great. So um, the Trinity refers to um, the three persons who are God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Where does that come from? Uh, it's from a lot of different places. Not least of which we can say right now, anyway, Jesus instructs the disciples after his resurrection um, to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, he speaks often about this spirit who's going to come. And tonight we want to look at one of the ways to begin to understand the person of the Holy Spirit. So when we say that God is a trinity, it doesn't mean that there's three gods. There's one God, that is to say there's, uh, there's one nature of God. And there's three persons in God. Or there are three divine persons, I should say. The persons are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Because they told us. It's the only way we can know that. It's the only way we can know that. It's not like a bunch of brilliant people sitting around 2,000 years ago with a nice glass of scotch sitting. I think maybe God's a Father, and a Son, and a Holy Spirit. No. That's not how this came. It came from God's revelation most especially from the revelation that Jesus gives us. Identifying his Father, and also helping us understand that we have access to the Father, and then telling us about this Spirit who will come. Okay? When we say Holy Spirit, that's not to say that the Father and the Son are not holy. It becomes something like a proper name, if you will, of the third person of the Trinity. Person answers the question, who is it? Nature answers the question, what is it? Okay, so it's not like there's um, three masks that God wears. Like, now I'm going to put on the Father's mask, and now I'm going to put on the Son's mask, and now I'm going to put on the Holy Spirit's mask. Um, they are three distinct persons. Who's, this is important for us to, to grasp just a little bit as we begin, because if we're talking about something which can sound perhaps to many of us as just being rather abstract, kind of lofty theology, and what practical application does it have to like your life right now, or my life right now? I would argue actually that um, some at least basic understanding of the Trinity is essential for you and I if we're going to understand how to find happiness. Why? Because you and I are created in the image and likeness of God. So in order to understand who we are, it only makes sense that we need to know something of who God is. You with me so far on that? So, if we're made in the image of God, what does that mean for us in our daily life? So the most basic thing that you can say about God is this. God is three. That's the most basic thing you can say about God. He's three. He's three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What is their life like? How does God live? And how would we know? Well, we know again from Revelation, which is to say from what God has revealed to us about the divine life, but perhaps this is, uh, I don't mean this to be careless, uh, and this isn't nuanced in any way, but perhaps rather provocatively we could say this about God's life. God's life is a life of uh, reckless self-giving. Reckless not in the sense of being careless or wasteful. Reckless in the sense of holding nothing back. So the Father pours everything into the Son. And the Son pours everything back to the Father. And their love for each other is so real and so intense that it actually, what we call it technically, spirates a third person. None of the three persons of the Trinity, uh, there was never a time when one of them did not exist. Okay, they're all God. What does that have to do with us? Well, that has a lot to do with us in the sense of how are you going to find happiness? means that if I would be happy, I must live something like the one in whose image I am made, 
Which means what? Which means I must love. Life's going to come from communion. It won't come from amassing stuff. Nothing wrong with stuff. We just can't satisfy it. Why? Because I'm not made for stuff. I'm made for communion. I'm made for love. I'm made for relationships. Authentic relationships. Why is it that we so often are leery of entering into relationships? Because we've been burned. Right? We've been hurt. We've made ourselves vulnerable. We've entered into a relationship. We got hurt. And then something like a wall went up and we said, that's never going to happen again. I'll be darned if I'm ever going to get hurt. And so as a response, we, we, don't, we don't really let people into our lives. And we don't really risk entering into other people's lives out of fear that I don't want to get hurt again. That makes total sense. I understand that entirely. More than you can imagine, probably. I was not always first. Um, I know what it's like to be in love. I know what it's like to be rejected. I know what it's like to be really bad to hurt. And I know what it's like to hurt others, quite frankly. But then the, the problem with that is if I live, and I've lived this way for a, a number of years in my life, very deliberately with a wall up. Perhaps some of you have lived this way. Perhaps some of you are living this way right now. It's a defense mechanism, is what it is. You know, I'll let somebody get so close into my life, but that's it. Because you can pass that threshold, and all of a sudden I'm in a place where I'm um, leery where this could go, because you might, at a certain point, not reciprocate. You might not tr prove to be a true friend. And if you don't prove to be a true friend, then what's the response to that? In my life, my response is, I got hurt again, and I don't like getting hurt. <laughs> I don't like being a pin cushion. So the wall stays up. But again, so long as the wall's up, I never do what I'm made for. Does that make sense to everybody? Anybody got a question on that, or a comment on that? I, I think this is one of the single most crucial things to grasp as we talk about the Trinity. It has profound repercussions and ramifications for how we live life. Like I don't enter, I don't enter into business with Michael because it's a mutually agreeable exchange of benefits whereby you know, I serve you or help you so that I can get what I want out of it and you can get what you want out of it. And so we negotiate. That, that's kind of an economic theory which operates on a lot of people's levels, or out, out of which a lot of people operate, I should say. But to know the Trinity, to know that I'm made in the image and likeness of God, is to know, no, I have to enter into a relationship with you, or else I'm never going to become an authentic human being. But the problem with this is it's always risky. Always. Because any time that I let somebody into my life, or you let somebody into your life, there is constantly the potential that it will not be reciprocated. We all know this. I think the, the challenge right now, and maybe the topic that we're looking at tonight with regards to the Holy Spirit in particular, is, to, uh, is really great news. I mean, gospel means good news. The good news right now is the first thing that God wants you and I to know is that you're loved. That's the first thing he wants you to know. Sometimes we get the impression that the message of the gospel is stop. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. By all means, don't do that. And to be sure, there is a response that is required in coming into a relationship with God. But that's not where you begin. You begin with uh, being overwhelmed by the reality of God's love for you. Who does that? I can't do that. It's not up to me to convince you of that. I couldn't convince you of that. Quite frankly. I don't have a handout for that. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. We're starting to talk about tonight. Okay? Does that set the table for what we're going? That's why 
That's why the lab element of tonight, if you will, or of this topic, we have much we get into it, is, um, is really a lot of fun. The lab, if you will, is when we were in school and you have the lecture and you have the lab, okay? So the lab is on you. You have to do that. We keep saying that, but there's something that we have to do after this. It's not enough for us to come sit here. This is not about amassing data and information. This is about transformation as a result of an encounter. Well, the Holy Spirit is the one who facilitates that encounter. So, let me just flip your Bibles open to Luke 11. What I want you to see here is that it's, this is not a question of me trying to promote a few ideas that I've kind of pulled out of nowhere. These, these are Jesus' words. So he's talking about prayer here. It's Luke 11, starting at verse 5. He's talking about the importance of prayer. He says, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to say before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. So it's kind of like me, you know, Father Clement and I live together for a little while, then he gets moved to another parish, and I find out, oh my gosh, Father Steve's coming to visit. I'm totally underprepared. I drive over to Father Clement's rectory, I ring the doorbell, I go, hey, bro, I'm really sorry, but um, I have no food in the house, and it's after midnight. If you got any food, you can borrow you. He's like, uh, Father John, I'm asleep. What are you doing? I know, but I really need some food. No, I'm not going to help you. So I just keep doing this Hey, I'm not going to go away until you open the door. Jesus says, though he wasn't motivated by desiring to help me, he was motivated by the desire to have this stuff. So he's going to get up and come and give me what I want. What Jesus says next is, God is nothing like that. That's not why God answers prayers. His response is not, fine, you know what, James, just shut up, okay? Whatever you want, I'll give you. I hear you. We're like that with people. At least I can be. But God's not like that. I tell you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Now, clearly, Jesus doesn't mean, you know, you just say, Lord, I just really believe you're going to give me a Cadillac. So, thank you. Uh, that does not work. That's not what he's saying, as he's going to make clear at the end. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? And this is how Jesus ends. If you then, who are evil, know how to give to your children good gifts, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So in a certain sense, we can could, we could understand what Jesus is saying right now to say what the Father most wants to give to us as children, that which is best for us, is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus talks about how this Spirit is going to come. He calls Him a, a variety of different names. One of the names that He uses is Paraclete. It's not a small bird. It's a parakeet. All right? What's a paraclete? Paraclete gets translated in a variety of different ways. Somewhat more poetically, uh, the translation that I find to be really helpful is uh, the one who answers the cry. That's what the spirit does. It's a legal term, paraclete. It's an advocate. It's another way you can translate it sometimes. When Jesus says, I will send you the advocate. So we have an accuser. The accuser is Satan. That's what Satan means. I'm going to talk much more about him as time goes by. We also have an advocate. The advocate stands by our side. He doesn't just stand by our side. He is within us. At least for those of us who have been baptized, those who have yet been baptized, here's the really exciting news. God's about to move in. And what he does, among the things that he does, perhaps the most 
important thing to emphasize tonight of what he does is he answers the cry. What cry? I think there's two. So we'll, we'll try to look at one, and then we'll see how far we get. The first cry is, I think, as simple as this. Behind all the facades that we have, you know, behind all the, hey, you know what, I'm doing just fine, thank you very much, I, uh, I don't need anything. Behind how well we can look. Uh, and how well put together and how successful we might be, how many degrees we've got, what kind of shape we're in, whatever it might be. Deep down in all of us, some of us have just kind of buried it really well. But deep down in all of us, there's a real fear that I'm just not loved. Or I'm loved because I can do X. Or I look like X. Or I have some value to people as a result of what it is that I can do or say or whatever. We see this all the time with our youth when we take them on retreat. Most of our, most of, not all, but most of our youth um, really do know conditional love. They know love because I'm so proud of you, three point. Or I'm so proud of you, varsity is a son. So proud of you, you're as popular as you are, and you're dating so and so. And though the parents may not be saying this, implicit in that the way our kids understand it, I know this because they say it to me all the time, whether it's in counseling, confession, whatever it might be. Many of them will say, not all of them by any means, but many of them will say, I've never known love just for me. It's always been as a reward. I'm thinking of a, a young person who came to talk to me one time who was uh, uh, an extraordinary athlete, whose parents would race them all over to high-level um, AAU tournaments. Everything revolved around this. They understood their worth, and I mean intentionally, uh, third person, plural, sorry. But uh, they understood their worth because uh, it was constantly reinforced to them that they were esteemed because of how successful they were athletically. They would sneak out pretty regularly at night to go sleep around with different people because they were crying for love. And they didn't get it at home. And their parents had no idea that all this person was screaming for was if I couldn't play sports, would you still care? Would I still matter? Because everything that they had experienced from their parents all revolved around this. So there was this huge gaping wound in the person's life with regards to am I for who I am love? As we get older in life, I think the, the reality is because uh, we've made some of the decisions that we've made, we just kind of become fearful of, well, you know, you're all sitting at the table with me right now, but if you really knew what my struggles have been or are presently, you would be sitting with me. Just the other day, I sat down with a person who uh, had uh, contemplated ending their life was that close. So we got talking about what led them to that place. I mean, this close, they were found by the police, they were hours away from dying. Decisions that they've made in the past. So I just real candidly looked at the person and said, can you tell me what it is you're so ashamed of? I said, well, I think God can handle it. Led them through a, you know, an act of repentance right there. Led them through some sense of you know, confession, repentance. Spent some time praying in front of the crucifix, looking at the Lord's love. 
understanding that Jesus is on the cross because of the lies I've told people. He's on the cross because of the really vile things I've done in my life. That makes the cross to be extraordinarily good news. It means I know I've got a place I can go. I know there's hope for me. No matter what, there's hope for me. I'm reminded this particular individual that three of the greatest figures in the Bible all committed the sin of murder. Moses, David, and Paul. It's really good news. After Moses commits murder, God uses him to free his people from slavery. After David commits murder, and adultery for that matter, God calls him a man after his own heart because he repents and lives a life that's really belonging to God. After Paul commits murder, he becomes the greatest apostle to the Gentile world that there's been. Those things are there in the scriptures to remind us we have reasons for hope. But it doesn't matter what's in the past. Not it doesn't matter that it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter in that it doesn't matter that whatever it is you've done or I've done, there's always mercy in it. That's what the Holy Spirit helps us to come to know. Okay? So what Jesus is telling us in this passage is the Father is longing to give to us the gift of of the Holy Spirit. If you take nothing else out of tonight as we're anticipating first pitch, take this. Ask the Father to give you the Holy Spirit in abundance. And ask the Spirit to answer that cry. How does that happen? So we looked at the a couple weeks ago now, maybe three weeks ago, we looked at uh, the fatherhood of God. And the challenge then was to uh, beg Jesus to help us know who the Father is. And that he loves us not for what we have or haven't done, but for simply who we are. This, this really is intended to build upon that. Flip to Romans chapter 5 first book after Acts. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. I was teaching a Bible study right after I was ordained. I had a bunch of women who wanted to dive into Scripture, who never really read Scripture, and were doing the letter to the Romans. Week three, a woman says, the Romans, where were they from? <laughs> so that would be Rome. Oh, Rome, well, Italy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. So that's what Paul's writing to, in case you don't know. There is no such thing as a dumb question. So Paul's writing to the Christian community in Rome. And he says this in Romans 5, verse 5. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That is not poetry. That's reality. The Holy Spirit has been poured into, at least for those of us who have been baptized, those who are going to be baptized, again, this is going to be a reality that's going to take place that you are going to experience to one degree or another. So, those who have been baptized huh, have the Holy Spirit who lives within, dwells within them. He lives in your heart. He lives in you. We're, teacher I once had said, uh, the Holy Spirit is in us the way heat is in hot water. I always love that answer. Where is heat not in hot water? No. It's everywhere. It's all pervasive. The Holy Spirit doesn't just, he's not just, you know, here in this one little part of my life, or my, one part of my body here. He, 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 he abides in me. He dwells in me. Uh, I am a temple, Paul will say in another place, of the Holy Spirit. Some of us may be oblivious to that. But I would suggest that this particular scripture might just want to wake us up to that reality, and that might be an invitation for us to ask the Holy Spirit to wake up within us. So the Holy Spirit dwells in us, as in the temple. And he wants to do something. He wants to convince me that God is not my adversary, that he is my father. So, 
let's keep flipping through a little bit more forward in the scriptures. Flip to the first letter of St. John. It'll be the fourth to the last book in the Bible. Last book's Revelation, then the first, second, third. That's the fifth book, actually. First, second, third John, Jude, Revelation. So 1 John, chapter 4, verse uh, 10. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the expiation for our sins. Why is this such a significant passage to pray with? This is my experience of how I lived my life and how I experience many other people living their lives. Okay, there's a giant anvil that's hanging above my head that God is waiting to drop on me the moment that I am disobedient. And my task is to try to just live as good a life as I possibly can so as to not have him drop the anvil on my head. It's a caricature, obviously, but that's incredibly how a lot of people live their lives. That God's only really pleased with me when I live well, and when I don't, like, brimstone is just around the corner at every step. So I'm going to try to live my life in such a way that when I'm done, hopefully I just measure it. What John's saying is, before I even existed, God loved me. That's why I exist, is because he loves me. He loves me so much, he desired to create me. I obviously didn't do anything to win his love. And so now what life is supposed to be, don't misunderstand what I was saying earlier, by all means how we live our lives is important. Jesus makes that clear. But life is supposed to be lived as a response to the love that I've already come to know, as opposed to live in such a way so as to get God to love me. Does that make sense? That's what a lot of people do with really immature relationships. So I'll try to conform myself to what I think you'll like in the hope that you'll like me, if not love me. But you really won't love me for who I am. I'm, I'm trying to make myself into something that I imagine you would like. A lot of us live that way with God in one way or another. Why? Because we've never really experienced his love for us. We've heard it, perhaps many of us have heard it for decades. God is love, God loves you, smile, God loves you. My favorite bumper sticker, God loves you, everybody else thinks you're naked. But, um, it's true in my life oftentimes, you know, I'm grateful that at least he does. But we live our lives that way. When the reality is, even though we've heard in one way or another someone say to us, God loves you, I don't know that. I'm not convinced of that. The Holy Spirit, I don't ask the Holy Spirit to do that within me. I haven't asked him to convince me that that, that cross, that man on that cross happened for me. Why? Because the Father loves me. That he, the son who's hanging on that cross, did that for me. Why? Because he loves me. And he's inviting me to friendship, to fellowship. He's inviting me to his own life. I might have heard that, but I, I either thought, eh, I don't, just don't buy it. It can't be true. Not, not if you knew what was in my past. Or I've never taken the time to really intentionally, deliberately ask the Holy Spirit to make me convicted of that. And, and that's the theme of tonight, is to beg the Holy Spirit to do that, to convict you and convince you that it's true, that it's not my words, that it's God's word which he wants to accomplish within us. So life is a response as opposed to an attempt to win. I think it goes without saying those are two really different ways of living, but uh, I'm not sure that we grasp it as often as we should. So life is a response to love that I already have received as opposed to an attempt to win love. And again, because, you know, at whatever age we all are right now, so many of us haven't exactly had the greatest of relationships. And I'm not trying to paint a sob picture, because some of us here have had great relationships almost all of our lives. Others of us, not so much. 
every person here has got a story, and we're all pretty fragile. We just aren't really interested in letting everybody see everything behind the mask, which makes sense. I get that. So some of it's not that we've all had really tragic, traumatic relationships, but if you've lived, you've been hurt by them. Or you haven't lived. And so what that does is it just kind of conditions us again to being fearful that, well, God's probably a lot like other people are. And since other people's love for me is oftentimes conditional, certainly God's is. And I'm trying to help you realize through the scriptures the word of God that that's not true. It's not conditional. So we, we have to see that the cross and the centrality of Jesus' cross and of his resurrection the love that manifests for me is the event, if you will, which now my whole life responds back to. So we, we've talked about that this is a year of faith. It's a year in the Catholic Church which is dedicated to the theme of faith. I have suggested using a definition that I find very intriguing um, and very much part of the catechism that a friend of mine uses, a teacher of mine, that faith is God's work in me to which I respond. That's best understood by praying in front of the crucifix. So faith is, first of all, something that God does within me. What's he do within me? He helps me understand that happened for me. It didn't just happen for us. It happened for me. Scripture at a certain point uh, in talking about what Jesus has done for us on the cross says that for the joy that was before him, this is the letter to the Hebrews, for the joy that was before him, Jesus endured the cross. What's he talking about? What's the joy? You. You're the joy. So what the Holy Spirit wants to say to you and to me as I pray in front of the crucifix is to help me understand that from the cross, hard as this is to fathom, Jesus, the one through whom the entire universe was fashioned, is saying to you and to me, you are worth the trouble. Fancy that. You are worth the trouble. For me to endure all that I have endured, you are worth it. In fact, it was a joy. It was a joy to become man to save you. Who does that? The Holy Spirit does that. Two ways then I have to respond. So it's not enough that God does the work in me, sooner or later I gotta respond to it. I either respond by saying, I will make you, Lord, the center of my life. And now confident that no one loves me like that, that there's no one I can trust like that, because no one would do that for me. Confident that you are not cruel, not capricious, not arbitrary, not vindictive, that you are my father, I will now respond to you by entrusting it to your hands in my life. That's the second part of faith. God's working me, it's the Holy Spirit convicting me that that happened for me, to which I respond. What's the response that God is thirsting for? What does he want? He wants, he wants my response. He wants me to surrender. It is the hardest decision anybody here will ever make in life to do this. I give up. I lay down my arms, my weapons, the things that I rebel and fight you against with. I lay them down, Lord, I will surrender. Because overwhelmed by what it is that I have come to know now that you love me in a way which is unimaginable, or would be if it wasn't true, I give you my life. And that's the Christian life. That's what we want to, the goal of what we're doing in all of these weeks is to be able to get to that point. So for those who have those not been baptized, so some people have already done that, but just not Catholic. Others of us are still getting to try to really figure out who this Jesus is. Thus, the work in the lab, if you will, becomes so important for us. To just spend time praying from the crucifix, saying, okay, Holy Spirit, help me to know this. Father keeps talking about this, help me to know it. 
But then sooner or later, we want to get to the point where we can say, okay, I surrender everything. In fact, this is what Jesus is going to ask of us if we would be his disciples. In, in Mark's Gospel, he says, if anyone would come after me, he must, and then there's three conditions. Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That first expression, deny myself, doesn't mean uh, I'm going to fast a couple times a week. That's not what he means. It doesn't mean I'm going to sleep on a bed of nails. It's not penance. That's not what he's saying. To deny yourself um, comes, the way we would think of it um, more today would be something like a, um, some sort of a transaction. It means to say something as, as direct as, okay, I sign over the rights of my life to you. It's a deed. It's like signing a title when you buy a car. The dealer signs it, hands it to you, it's your car. The mortgage is paid off, it's my house. This is what Jesus is saying. Ultimately, our response to him is supposed to be. And if you really think about who it is that we're responding to, it's the only logical response. Because who else would I surrender to? But what he's saying to me is, sooner or later I have to get to a point where I would say, okay, you own my life. But he doesn't own it so that he can control it and you know, manipulate it and do whatever he wants with it just to kind of be some sort of taskmaster. The paradox of the Christian life is it's only by surrendering everything to him that I actually ever really become free. Because if he's not in control, it means somebody else is. And if somebody else is, it's not God. And if it's not God, I can't be free because only God can lead me to freedom. Why is this so hard for us? This is so hard for us because we have spent far too much time listening to the voice of the accuser and not of the advocate or the paraclete, the one who answers the cries. The accuser. The accuser is Satan. What's Satan's diabolical strategy? It's this. He does not love you. And then he just keeps building on that. Isn't it obvious he doesn't love you? How many prayers haven't been answered? How many tragedies have you asked for help that haven't been thwarted? How many heartbreaks have you had? How often have you asked for something you did not receive, seek and you didn't find, knock and it didn't seem to be over? That's Satan's lie. That's his strategy. And, and perhaps the challenge for us tonight is to recognize, well, you know, I've spent a considerable amount of time in my life being really attentive to that voice. Or I've heard that voice often. And I've fallen for it. Pope John Paul II, uh, I think I, uh, I have it for you here in one of the handouts, which you can get as you walk out, um, talks about how really sobering it is to realize that at the beginning of creation, when Satan gets our first parents, Adam and Eve, to rebel, the strategy to get them to rebel is to get them to doubt that God is good. So he turns the father into the adversary, into our enemy to our opponent, and to the enemy of freedom. And what Pope John Paul II says is, so realize that Adam and Eve fell for this, if you will, and Adam and Eve had no experience of God except his goodness. They only knew his goodness. They walked with him, the scripture says, in the cool of the day. It's a poetic expression for talking about the intimacy that, they had, that our first parents had with God. They knew no sin. They had no disposition to be selfish. They had no disposition to be afraid of God. They weren't afraid of each other. They knew nothing but perfection. So his point is, if Satan can get them, who only know reality in its perfect form, to doubt God's goodness, in essence, he can have, if we're not careful, a field day with us. And that's the diabolical strategy is to try to tell us and to convince us in one way or another that God is not good, that he's not a father. The response to that is what we're talking about right now. The response to that is what we're 
Why? Because what the Holy Spirit does within me, two passages, Galatians 4, verses 6 and 7, and Romans 8, verses 15 to 16. What the Holy Spirit does, St. Paul tells us, is he cries out within us, Abba. What's Abba? Abba does not mean daddy. It's an expression that um, some of us have heard before, some of us have never heard. Not daddy in the sense of being a cute word. Abba is this extraordinarily intimate expression of a child, and when it says that, knows that its father will respond. That's what the Holy Spirit cries within us. Abba. Father. Like it's the cry of a child who's in desperate need of its father's help. It's like a child, the way a friend of mine described it once, he was talking about being in a supermarket in uh, Tel Aviv one time, and he's walking down the line, you know, or down all the aisles, and there's this little, you know, four-year-old boy in the frozen food section all alone, and just goes, Abba! And as soon as he cries that, he cries that knowing, like, on the other side or two aisles away or something is, coming! You know, sure enough, his father comes around the corner and picks him up. That's the cry. It's a cry of certainty. It's not, it's not so much a cry of cuteness, it's a cry of absolute certainty. I know the relationship that I have with you, and therefore when I cry this, you come. Of course, you didn't come from somewhere because it's never been absent. But that's what it means. That's, that's what the Spirit cries within us. Ah, he's trying to bring me into a deeper and deeper and deeper relationship with the Father. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah? Why is it so important? Because uh, what, what Paul says... Um, in this passage here is that God has given us not a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. What's the fear? The fear is about God. The fear is that he doesn't love me. The fear is that he won't come. The fear is that he doesn't care. That's the fear. Or that he'll come for you because you've been good, but he won't come for me because I've got bad in my past. He would have come if I hadn't done that, but I've done that now, so now he ain't coming anymore. That's the fear. And we can sit here and laugh and think, oh, yeah, but we know deep down that's a reality in our lives. If we're really honest with ourselves. At least I think it is for almost all of us. There's, there's something in this whole discussion that is lurking in the back of our minds going, that just cannot be true. And that's the voice of the enemy. That's the diabolical strategy. Or it's true, but not for you. So the Spirit answers the cry, convicts us of the reality that God is not my enemy, he's not an obstacle to my freedom and my happiness, he's the one who is my friend, he's my father, he's the one who made me for freedom and happiness. And the result of all that is, I have hope. Great hope. So, I want to end with this. There's another handout out here, which is the, uh, it's a homily given hundreds and hundreds, like 1,600 years ago, from a man who's talking about the baptism of Jesus. So when Jesus is baptized, and we'll talk much more about baptism and all this, don't, don't get lost in, like, why did Jesus get baptized? Don't get lost in that right now. When Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, something happens. Anybody know what happens? Something comes from the sky. Spirit in the form of a dove. Why a dove? Someone for peace. That's what we use it for now, but it wasn't then. Is a dove a biblical image? The ark. Yeah, the ark. So listen to this. I just think this is really cool. Today the Holy Spirit hovers over the waters in the likeness of a dove. A dove announced to Noah that the flood had disappeared from the earth. Remember, that's, that's the story of uh, Noah's flood. So the waters begin to subside. He sends out some birds. They come back with nothing. Finally, a, a dove comes back with an olive branch. Does that tell Noah? It tells him it's safe to leave the ark. That's what the point was. So building on that, remember we talked last week about types we talked about the Ark of the Covenant as a type of Mary. We talked about how the waters of the Red Sea is a type of baptism. So the dove in the Old Testament is a type of the Holy Spirit. What did the dove say to Noah? It said it was safe. 
That's the point that we're supposed to take when the dove lands on the person of Jesus. Here's how this guy puts it. A dove announced to Noah that the flood had disappeared from the earth. So now a dove is to reveal that the world's shipwreck is at hand. In the person of Jesus, the mess and the tragedy and the shipwreck that is humanity and human history is over. God has come to save. And it's safe. Not safe in the sense that, hey, nothing's ever going to happen to you again. Safe in the sense that you and I now have unshakable hope. Why? Because the Spirit helps me to know that the one who's got everything in his hands is not some cruel, bored, capricious God, but a Father. So, what I would suggest we do today, uh, on your way out, grab the handouts by all means, please. There's a set of different things which I can explain at a, a later time. We'll come back to this, but I think the, the challenge for us as we go home is to do uh, two things. First, to ask the Father to do what it is that he promised in the Gospel of Luke. Give me your Holy Spirit. You said you would give him, and you said you'd give him far more than any parent would give to his or her gifts, good gifts. So I, your child, who you created in your image and likeness, who made for relationship with you and asking you to simply do what it is that you promised you would do. I'm asking for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in my life. Second, as you do that, to pray in a very specific way in front of a crucifix. It could be a small one that you have in your house, it could be a big one in the church, doesn't matter. And just do Continually be asking the Holy Spirit as you're sitting there in front of your space, help me to understand this. Help me to know this was for me. Help me to know that I don't have to worry about earning the reward. Let's just trust that the Lord will act dramatically in the week 